Sergio, how are you doing? Hello, man. All good, thank you. And you? I'm I'm good as well. Uh, we've been trying to set this up for up for a minute, but I'm uh, I'm glad we uh, we finally got to it. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so this will be uh, the relaunch, uh, the first episode of the relaunch of the um, the new and improved Improving Always podcast. Um, so it's going to be you know rotating guests, but uh, you know Sergio will definitely be be back for uh, for more episodes in the future because um, he's. Uh, an incredibly uh, interesting guy. Um, so I'll do a little like introduction here, um, and then we'll we'll hop into it. I have you know basically just kind of want to talk through your story, uh, but I do have like some like specific questions. Um, the the thing that I uh, I, I read so I've read uh, Sergio um, has a you know an, uh, I guess a uh, biography, um, right. Because, uh, you know, written by, uh, someone, someone, you know, um, who told your story about, you know, playing professional, uh, or your journey to play professional football. Cause most of the book probably is before you signed, uh, a, a, a professional contract, uh, and all the stuff that kind of went into that. Um, so in, in the, the reason that I think it is probably, the most valuable story I've ever, you know, read or, or been told, um, about someone, um, who, who ended up playing professional football, um, the most valuable story for other, you know, young footballers to listen to is because, um, a lot of the stories that I see on maybe social media or really, really huge, uh, you know, big name players, um, are very glamorous. Um, and the, uh, the book, the, the Sergio, um, Sergio Torres story, um, it, there are moments, there are like magical moments, but the whole, the book in and of itself is, I would say it's not glamorous. It, when I, I read it, so I read it, um, a friend of mine, um, uh, Sergio's Argentinian, um, a friend of, uh, of his, um, who I, I worked with in Spain gave me the book on my way, um, when I was leaving Spain to come back to the States and I read the book on the plane and, uh, that, that was what I did on the plane. Um, and then I got back to Boston and the next morning I started reading it again. Um, and the reason was it was the, one of the realest, like the, just so real. Um, and I, and I think that's why, um, it's something that I want to make sure that any young footballer whose dream is to go pro, um, reads this book and hears, or at least, you know, listens to this maybe and hears, uh, some parts of, of Sergio's story. Um, I think there's this kind of two, um, uh, this is going to sound a little bit funny, but have you ever watched the movie uh, Goal? Are you talking to me? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course, of course. Of course, yeah. okay, um, good. Yeah, yeah. 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 A so people, uh, a, lot, a, lot of people, a lot of people told me that my story is quite, um, it's a bit related to that. And then yeah. I, can actually, I can actually see myself, especially at the beginning when um, the few training sessions when he gets kicked for fun in, yeah. the, rain, <laughs> in the rain, in the wet. And I was like, yeah, Santiago, Santiago Munes. Yeah. Um, I think the my um my favorite moment of that um of that movie. And that movie, you know, I probably watched that movie the first time when I was like eleven or twelve or something. So it was like right at and it and that was that was kind of like the the time like, you know, I had played uh football before that, but that was the time when I was really starting to like, you know, dream of, you know playing in, you know, for in big leagues or big teams playing in the world cup and all this stuff. Um, and, um, so it's a movie that even though, you know, when I watch it now and I see all the, you know, the horrible acting and the, you know, it's, it's a fun, it's a funny movie sometimes, but it has like, uh, it's, it's actually a movie that still, when I watch it now, I think I watched it like a year ago or something it can make me a little bit emotional just because like, you know, I watched it when I was a kid and it was like, Oh my God. Um, you know, it's one of my, it was like my favorite movie for so long. And my favorite moment of that movie is, um, after Santiago's, uh, dad, uh, passed away and then he's going to go home and, you know, take care of business and stuff. But then he comes back to the training ground and, um, 
the coach asks him why he's there. Um, and he said, and he says something about how he was sitting in the airport, um, thinking about, um, how at least now he had an excuse for why, you know, prof- things didn't work out. He had to go home. You know, his dad died. No one's going to question him and be like, why'd you go home? Uh, you know, because obviously it's such a huge thing, but then he says that he doesn't need an excuse anymore. Um, and he, he wants to, you he wants to be there and make it happen. And, um, that was so powerful to me because I think there's kind of, there's two kinds of, uh, of, of, uh, athletes, two kinds of footballers, whatever we're talking about. Um, there are those who look for, you know, maybe they work hard, but they're still kind of looking for an excuse. So they get injured. They don't come back a coach treats them in like in a wrong way. And that's when they give up. A lot of athletes can be really talented. A lot of footballers can be really, really great players. Um, and they're the best on their team. They're the best on their team all the time when they're a young player. And as soon as things get hard, they start looking for excuses. And when I was reading, uh, your, your book, the story of your life, uh, or at least your, your football career, um, and I'd say, you know, a big part of your life as well, because it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, just talk about the football side of things. Um, there were so many moments that it would have been so easy to give up. So um, easy to give up. So easy, so easy to not even start, right? Um, you know, the, even the, the the very, you know, the first chapter of the book, um, and you're, you know, you're going to this country with $300 in your pocket where you don't speak the language, you know, on a, like a, a wish and a prayer. Um, and, and, you know, things, it wasn't like it just, you know, everything got better every day. So many setbacks, so many, um, difficult situations. It would have been, I'm sure you, you had so many moments you could have given up and probably no one would have been like, Oh, people would have still thought, Oh, you tried, you do this, but you're so determined and you didn't look for excuses. And I think yeah, that something, Chris, something yeah, you, you read in, something you, you haven't read in the book as well. Uh, actually, someone asked me today, which his son is wants to be a professional footballer. He's training. He's 15 years old. And he asked me today, what were you like when you were 15? Be- um, and then I was like, you know what? When I was 15 years old, I was that tall. I was so tiny. I had a coach who told me I need to go and see a doctor because I got growing problem, problems. He didn't play me for about three to six months. I was playing five minutes every now and then, some games not even coming on. And there was one, two special games where he was about to put me on and, the, and the, the, the referee blew the whistle twice. And I was like, I remember I went outside crying to my dad. He was well on the, on, on the stand watching me, I was 15. And I said to my dad, I don't want to play anymore. And then, and then, and then he was like, of course, really hurt, trying to take me to another club. But this club I've been since I was uh, six years old, six to 15, yeah, in Argentina. So, and then, and then um, I was, I had all my friends, everyone was playing apart from me. So I said to my dad, no, no, I'm going to wait for this manager to go. I'm not going anywhere else. And, and I did that. And then about, I don't know, six months later, this manager left. A new manager, which he know me, he knew me, and I started playing again. So I, I did give up when I was fifteen. Yeah. And then, but I knew I wanted to go back playing. Yeah. But this was when I was fifteen, so I was telling this guy that today, and actually put me in my mind. Look, I, I completely forgot about this. That I stopped playing for about six months, and and then, but I think that made me more determined at that age. And I went like, you know what? I got something to prove to someone, which. You shouldn't be like that, you know. You should play for yourself, and then and then don't bother about what other people say. But at that at that age, it really got me going, thinking I'm going to prove this guy wrong. And uh, it took me a long while until I was 24 when I ended up signing my first contract, professional contract. But I think that made me. I don't know. I had something a fire inside my belly that I was like, I I I'm going to try my hardest to make it as a professional. That was my dream. And this yeah. guy, because I'm too small, is not going to take it away from me. Yeah, I think that's so uh, amazing. You know, you're talking about like when you're 15, like I get messages from players like I'm 14, 15. I'm not playing in a in a professional academy. Is it too late for me? I'm like, are you kidding me? 
like th- this is insane um and then you know you just said you you signed your first professional contract when you were 24 um most people you know <laughs> would have given up well yeah what would have given up a long time before that (laughs) um so at you know let's let's start um there at the at the beginning then once you started playing for that team um again this was still for the for the youth like the under 18s or under 16s or something in argentina yeah 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 yeah. okay yeah, yeah tell me a little bit about like you know um when I, I think you left that team at some point to play for a different team in in Argentina, like a men's team, and then how did you um how did you end up getting uh you know the opportunity to go to uh, well to go to um Berlin? so I was uh, I was playing in my local city uh, from Buenos Aires. Well, probably everyone knows Buenos Aires is a big capital where mainly all the teams are. But I was from oh, I'm from a city called Mar del Plata, which is five hours away. So I was playing for my local team since I was five six until I was about twenty. And then I had the opportunity to go in the same city, but play regional. So not play just in the city. Is that was the fourth division of Argentina. Mm-hmm. And and then I took this decision to leave this club all my life. And then I was just like, you know, I'm gonna focus one year. I'm 20 years old. And and then yeah, I played one season, played really well this season in the new club. I made a, a CD of, of me playing. But by this point, in my head, I was always saying. I'm already 20 here, 20, 21. In Argentina, if you're 19, 20 and you didn't make it, it's going to be so hard, so yeah. hard. That is Argentina. Um, and then, but talking about this story, when I was 18 and 19, I went on trial to two professional clubs in Buenos Aires. And then and then the first one, two weeks, after the first week, said, yeah, we really like you. We'd like to have you back. So I went the second week and they say, sorry, um, we haven't got space for you. So that was the first club. Uh, Vélez Sarfield, maybe you know it. It's a big club in Argentina. And then it was another club called Chacarita. And then um, they were in the top division in Argentina as well. The same thing happened. Two weeks there, trained really well. But it, was, uh, it, it wasn't meant to be. The, yeah. the manager said, no, you choose. you're no better than what we got. Mm-hmm. So, so basically, um, I took that year. I played in this team. Yeah, and then I already made my... Uh, um, Italian passport because my grandmother was Italian and in my head I, I don't know why but so many Argentinians used to went to Italy and Spain at that point and I'm like I want to go to Europe I want to really try Europe because where I, I was lucky enough when I was in the World Cup 1998 my dad his dream was to go to a World Cup and he saved money for about five years he took my sister, me, and my mom, we went for a month just traveling around France in a caravan. Oh, that's amazing. That was amazing. Following Argentina everywhere without tickets. Uh, anyway, with so many Argentinians, the embassy started giving tickets to if you have Argentinian passport. So we <laughs> went to, yeah, so at the real price, you know, not see yeah, yeah. Uh So we had to go to Paris to get the passport. And then I watched the best game I ever watched live, Argentina against England. I don't know if you remember um Beckham got sent off it was 1990 oh, right. quarter final it was the last 18 and then it was 2-2 we ended up winning on penalties anyway crazy and and then uh, the manager is so funny but the assistant manager from that from England it's called John Gorman he was uh, Glenn Hoddle's assistant manager that World Cup okay. and he's he like Eight years later, he's the man who signed me for Week on Wonders, my first professional. Oh coach. my, that's amazing! That's I was in the stand. Crazy. I was in the stand when I was sixteen. He was on the bench, and I had my face white and, and, and blue painted. <laughs> and, and then I remember, and I don't know, but this trip to France made me. I don't know. I was appreciating everything because it's beautiful, and I was like, "Is Europe like this? The whole Europe?" So, <laughs> so I was like, and then was, you ended up. <laughs> Exactly. It was, yeah, my dream was to play football, but I also thought yeah. this opportunity to, to go and, you know, meet new people and new, new culture. And, uh, and that's why when I was 22, I said, right, that's it. Uh, we sent the CV, an Argentinian uh, agent, uh, contacted an Argentinian agent in England who knew different agents. And I ended up with a um, Cameroonian agent who uh, sent my CV to my CD to Brighton. Brighton yeah. and Hovalman, but now they're in the Premier League. 
back then they were and in doing the well in the and doing well in the very, Premier League as well. Very well, very well. I did play some beautiful stuff, beautiful football. It's a beautiful club, and um, and yeah, that's why I went. It was a two weeks trial to Brighton. I had three hundred dollars. I said to my family, I said, "I'm going." They were like, You're crazy. Why? From one day to another, basically, I packed my bags. From the Saturday, I was living on the Sunday. And all my friends were like, what are you doing? You don't even speak English. And I was like, look, the ideal is now you would have been to go to Spain or Italy. But it wasn't <laughs> this is what I'm happened. I'm going to England. And that's how, um, yeah, when I was 22, I took that plane on my own. And then, uh, yes, um, it's, it's, it was amazing. It was an amazing decision. And, and, and then how well, I ended up in England. This Cameroonian agent picked me up from his house. And of course, in, in Argentina, back then, uh, mobile phones and all that weren't that, you know, I didn't even have a phone. So I remember my dad having like a phone like a brick. Like that was his <laughs> mobile phone. And so I went to England without, without a phone and, and nothing. And then this Cameroonian agent had a, a sign, Torres. So I was like, Are you, I'm Sergio, blah, blah, blah. And then he took me to his house, couldn't speak a word in, in you know, in, in, yeah. the, in the car. And then, I don't know, in Argentina, I was thinking London, uh, the Tower Bridge, uh, Big yeah. Ben, that's the things. And then we end up in the south of London uh, in a place called Norbridge, near Croydon. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's not the nicest place, put it that way. Mm -hmm. and, um, but yeah, it was, it, was, it was an amazing experience. Yeah. I want to say, when... Um... When you were on the plane, because obviously that's kind of like where, you know, in the in the book, that's where the story kind of starts is, um, you know, it goes back and talks about you as um, as a as a as a younger player. Um, but um, when you were on the plane headed to England, um, did you believe that you were going to make it like what was your what was your mindset sitting on the plane there? I, I, I'll be completely honest with you. Um, I used to watch a lot of the Premier League in Argentina. And I loved, I loved the Premier League until the day of today I watch every every game I can. And they used to show a lot of the of the games in Argentina from the Premier League. So in my head was right, I'm playing fourth division in Argentina, I'm doing well. Um I'm going to a third division club in England. I'll be fine. I say I'm I'll be fine. I, I believe in myself. I know I'm 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 quite a I used to be a, a quite a technically a good player. I used to play number 10, not really tackle yeah. that much to be one of these uh, luxury players, how you call it, in Argentina. Um, and then, uh, so in my head, in that plane, I was like, I was so confident, so okay. confident I was going to do well because I was so excited. I don't know. I was so excited of living, going back to Europe, uh, to a new, completely new culture, um, like I said, I didn't, I didn't feel like scared at all. I was just, I was just super excited, and then I, I was think, super confident. Yeah, I think that's uh, the the trick to like succeeding in anything is like. Um, like I always, I always say, you know, and sometimes people push back back against me because, um, you know, I I talk a lot about confidence and how I think it's the most you know important thing, um, but in my mind. Like, if you didn't believe in yourself, you wouldn't have even gotten on the plane, yeah. right? And at that point, if you don't get on the plane, it wouldn't have mattered how good you were because you wouldn't have given yourself a chance, right? 100%. So I think, 100%. like, even you maybe, and we'll get to, you know, the the struggles um, and, you know, spoilers, uh, you know, things didn't work out at Brighton. So, um, you know, it's... Uh, We'll, we'll, like we'll get to that part, but without without the confidence, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have done that. You wouldn't have given yourself a chance. And then you know, obviously, there were points like you weren't feel like that way that you were feeling on the plane on the way to England. That's not how you felt for your whole career in England. Definitely um, not. Definitely you, not. Yeah, exactly. After, I, I will tell you. After two days, I thought, "Oh my god, how wrong I am." <laughs> How yeah. wrong I was about I'm thinking I want to walk in here and then just walked into this club. Honestly, I was so wrong. Yeah. And it's like I think like the the trick, like I said, the trick to succeeding at anything is first, like without the confidence, without the belief, you don't you're not gonna have a chance because you're not even you're not gonna go. 
right? Um, like, like to, to make it like really simple, like I say, like if you're taking a player on in a 1v1, you're trying to dribble past them. If you don't think you're going to beat them, you have lost every time. Yeah. I've never dribbled past someone when I'm like, ah, I don't know. Am I going <laughs> to, am I going to do this? Like if, if they're a halfway decent player, it's over there. Um, but if, if I believe that I'm, I'm going to win the 1v1, I still, I might lose the 1v1, but I might win. Um, so it's like that belief, but you have to be able to keep going when that belief isn't, isn't always there or isn't always as strong. I think the belief should always be there, but when, because, you know, it do- doesn't matter how good you are, you know, you're going to get rejected. Uh, every, every, I, I don't think there's a single even professional footballer who didn't get, you know, didn't have a coach who didn't like him, didn't play him, sat him on the bench uh, or her, you know, what, whatever it was. Um, so you're going to face rejection and it's kind of keeping that belief e- even when you do get, um, when you, when you do get rejected. Um, 100%. Then let me add you something there that I learned up pretty quickly that someone told me uh, football is a game of opinions. Um, and then, and then it really is. It really is. I had coaches. I play every game for two years. Man of the match many times. One of the main players in the team. And then a new coach come in and completely pie me. Like, put me, sorry. <laughs> pie me, like <laughs> say in England. Is um, that it? I, I was going to ask if that was an English saying. or Because I lived in England for six years. I never heard someone say um, pie, pie you know, me. I'm, pie. Yeah, oh, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm going to start using that. <laughs> That's that, so yeah, a complete fight. Like, I mean, he put me on the stand, like, yeah, not even, sometimes not even on the bench. And I was like, What? And that's but I understood that very quickly. So, when, when football is a game of opinion, and some manager, I'm gonna like you, I'm gonna play you. Some manager, I don't know, might not you be your style, they don't like your personality, but that's when you carry on. That's when you just say, Right, this guy is not gonna be here forever. Or I'm going and find another club on loan or wherever. That's what I end up doing after. Yeah. I end up going on loan because I knew it. But this is coming after in in, in, in once I become one became a pro. Um but that, that first two weeks in Brighton, like going back to that, honestly, they were machines. They, yeah. I could not believe how quick, how strong, how powerful these players were. And and then I was like, I'm so little, skinny. Um my I used to touch the ball and they used to get, honestly, like the, in the movie, it's exactly like in the yeah. movie. Raining, like, raining really hard. I was going to use another uh, English phrase there. Uh, <laughs> raining hard. And then <laughs> and then getting tackled from, uh, as soon as I touch the ball, I'm of yeah. course. For them, it's like, you're coming to take the play, especially the midfielders. I was playing midfielder. I was getting smashed by the midfielders quite a bit. And then, and then they didn't even, you know, care about you. And I was like, probably they thought as well, who is this guy, Argentinian? I had my hair, proper long hair, blonde until, until my back. <laughs> I was a big ponytail. I didn't even speak a word of English. So I couldn't communicate like before the training. I used to go, yeah. all the drills, I used to right go at the back and then look at what they're doing because I was like, I did not understand the coach one bit. That was so, if I had to go back to myself, I said, please study English. My dad said, learn English in the secondary school. And I was like, nah, I don't need yeah. English. I will never go to America or England. And, I, and then I ended up going to England. And, yeah. and then I was so wrong, honestly. I was thinking, why didn't I not study English? That was probably one of the hardest thing to get used to was the, was the, the language barrier. Language. Because, because I couldn't communicate with anyone in the team. And then you feel just yeah. so, so out. I actually, I have a, I have a funny story because I, I uh, obviously I, as a kid, I spent time in uh, in the U.S. I was born in the U.S., but I spent a lot of time in Greece uh, as well. But I was always um, uh, kind of uh, self conscious about my my accent when I was this, when I was speaking Greek, and I would also make a lot of mistakes because it was my second language. Um, so I can speak it, like you know, fluently. And and now, you know, when I go to Greece, I don't really care about making mistakes. I'm older, and I, I just don't just don't care that much. But when I was, you know. I was playing for an academy when I was like 12, 13 and players make fun of me when I yeah. said like the wrong word. And it was, I, I was like, I was super nervous about it. And then I went, uh, this, um, so this, I, eventually I left the academy, but like it was, it was something that, 
um, happened a couple times, you know, players like kind of laughing uh, when I would say something, I was like, you know, like, what do you want from me? Um, and, um, but it did, it did get to me quite a bit sometimes, but I went on, uh, on a trial with a, uh, with a team in Greece in the fourth division. Uh, and I, I ended up joining that team, but when I went the first day of the trial, it was me, um, and another player from the same Academy who had played a lot more than me, uh, on the, on the Academy team was more of a, you know, um, yeah, supposedly that that coach that we had had thought he was better than me for sure because he played a lot more. Um, but um, when I went to the to the trial, I was like, I don't want to speak and mess up. I'm just not going to talk. So I didn't say a word the whole set. I didn't talk to any of my teammates, didn't talk to the coach. And um, the I had I had left the academy actually like six months before and I played for a uh, for a men's team for six months at a lower level. Um, and this player was coming straight from the academy, but anyway, um, the, um, I didn't speak, um, the other player coming from the academy went to talk to the coach at the end of the session because he, he wanted to, um, you know, we both played well. He wanted to talk to the coach at the end. I went to the locker room, grabbed my bag left. Um, and I got a, I got a phone call the next day from the coach who I'd been playing for the, for the last six months who sent me on the trial. Um, and he said, you're in. The other guy's not. And he said, uh, well done for not talking because this guy in the meeting with the coach had asked him, oh, I like the team. You know, I'd love to join, but will I get playing time? And the coach was like, what? You you get, yeah. <laughs> the stupidest question you can ever ask a coach uh, because you'll get playing time if you perform well in the training sessions and perform well in the games. Uh, and I, I, I say this all the time that it's such a stupid question to ask. And apparently me not talking, the coach had kind of thought that I was um, like, I was, he didn't know that I didn't, that it, Greek wasn't my first language. He thought that I was like so cocky, so arrogant. I didn't need to talk to the players, didn't need to talk to the coach. I was just like, you know, I'm going to rock up. I'm going to do my job uh, and peace out at the, at the end of the training session. Um, so it actually worked to my advantage um one time but it was um you know it was it was so it was so funny that that happened uh and obviously yeah i'm not i'm not like recommending you don't talk when you go to a trial or something uh because eventually you know i had to you know make friends on that team and, and talk to them but it, it was a bit of a funny experience of course, um, but yeah. it's, it's, it's a, I, I was just smiling when you said that because um it happened in every club i've been mm -hmm. uh, they were all taking the mickey off my accent yeah um, and then uh, but i just you know i'm i'm, I'm a person who I, I like to i like to laugh at things like that it's just i'm not taking it seriously but they were like just every single club and all the players like just taking the mickey how but that because i learn english by talking to people i never went to a lessons or stuff like that so i know i got a strong especially uh spanish speakers like we got i don't know really strong pronunciation and 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 then uh, the first few times I hear myself talking English, I was like, oh, my God, I used to hear me. I was like, no, I can't, I can't, I can't hear me anymore. I can't not hear me. And then, uh, but it happened to every club, mate. Uh, I went, I went yeah. through exactly the same. But I just, like I said, I just, I just laughed it off. And then uh, I was, uh, it was yeah. fine. So when, uh, so you, you were at, you were at Brighton, you were there for two weeks um and then you know after the after the two weeks what uh what happened well my agent was not very happy to me with me because uh the the manager um uh, a guy called mar mcgee he ended up managing um quite few clubs uh, i think he got one of the record for 1000 managerial uh oh. appearances in uh, in the football league in england he's a scottish guy uh, he worked with the national team as well. Uh, really nice guy. He pulled me after the second week. He said, we're supposed to have a, a game where that was going to be the decider, basically, because yeah. he said, I like what I'm seeing in training. Um, but this game got cancelled because of waterlogged pitch, which okay. happens a lot. Happens and, uh, so much. I remember from my time in England as well. Every every from December to you know the end of uh, end so, of January, every game is 50-50. <laughs> Yeah, if it's not frozen pitch, it's, uh, it's, it's waterlogged. Yeah. 
So anyway, we'll how say- had how had you j- just really quick? How had you thought? Uh, like he said that you've been doing really well in the sessions, and obviously you were talking about how like you know it was like a much like higher level, more physical and stuff. But how did you feel? Did you think like you were going to get taken? Mm, I was 50, 50. I was thinking okay. because some of the games, some of the small side games, I was doing really well, but it was when it went to 11, 11 that we were doing that. No one was passing the ball. And then five, if, when, when you used to do a small side game, like, you, you know, it's quick and it's quite technical. And then, um, so I was doing well there. I scored, I remember I was scoring a few goals and, and then I'm thinking, I'm doing all right. And the players, the second week, the first week, no one talked to me. The second week, I started to, in bad English, but at least make some little conversations. And and then um, and then so I thought, you know, after the second week, that Thursday, one of the last days of the second week was going to be this match, a friendly match. So I was preparing for... And then the day before that day, it rained like never seen before. And then basically that game got called off. And on the Friday, the manager said, look, I don't want to keep losing his time. He's a um, he's, 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 you know, like, great kid. He seems like a, he's, a, he's technically a very good player, but he's not strong. He's not physical enough for, for, for our football, for our league. And kind of he gave me a an, an, an recommendation. If you want to pursue your career in England, you have to develop more your physicality and your strength. And then, you know, at the time it hurt me a lot because I was thinking, well, you know, this is what's my, my chance. And I thought, well, this guy is right. This guy is right. Like, I could see it in the games. that I, They were how, machines. How long did it take you? Did Like when he was talking to you, were were you thinking like um, he's uh, – were, were you just getting angry or like no. sad or were you already thinking like he has a point? No, he, uh, I straight away, I go upset like, in my face probably, but I did understand he was spoken like, really slowly English. And then I, I do understand. Like, I did understand a little bit. Yeah. And then, uh, and then I, I don't know, I straight away, I done a click in my head. I'm thinking, he's got a point. He definitely got a point because I was feeling it every training session. That we used to do a lot of running without the ball as well. And I was kind of at the back of that like, a lot. And I'm thinking, how? How do they do it? I didn't, didn't know, stop it. <laughs> and raining that it was november time so imagine yeah. like, you pick you pick the right time to go for yeah sure. lovely time going from argentina going into the summer and then going into the winter in england three o'clock it was dark already um so i was like oh my god i never seen darkness so early and um so yeah in my head was like no nah, this guy's got a point so um so i said i said to my agent straight away he was not happy with me yeah not happy at all just, then, just really, just really quickly. I think that's so. I mean, you, you were 20, 20, 22. 21, 22, 22. Yeah. Um, at this point, I think it's crazy mature to, you know, be rejected like that. But at at the same point, be able to take something from that. Some a trick that someone told me once. Um, this wasn't about soccer, but I've actually used it in uh, in you know in sports as well. Um, was um when you let's say like you apply for a job and you get rejected always send an email saying um oh you know what was it exactly that yeah. uh made you yeah. not take me um it, like what notes would you give what, me on my interview what and stuff yeah, what yeah exactly I, yeah. I actually got a job that i got rejected for um that then they came back to me after i had sent that email Really? Um, and I'm not sure, you know, maybe I would have gotten the job anyway. Um, but I, but I sent that follow-up email. Um, and then the next email they sent back was, oh, actually, um, you know, the, we'd, uh, we'll, uh, we'll take you for the job or something. I think it's, uh, and I think it's similar for like, if you get rejected at a football trial or something, always find out why, because you can always learn something. And also you show like, if, if a coach rejects you, And you get mad at that coach and you say, you're a horrible coach, blah, blah, blah. Like maybe it feels good in the moment, but that coach is never looking at you again. But if you're really mature about it and you, you know, find out why you got rejected, why things didn't work out, not only can you learn from something from that, you also leave a really good impression on that Mm -hmm. coach. Um, and, and I, and I think that's, you know, and also like, you know, the football world can be small sometimes. So every interaction you have can matter quite a bit. Very. Uh, you, 
It's you so so correct on everything what you said there. Um, leaving that that good impression, I think is key. And always, well, I always say, be a nice person. Be a nice person. Don't be cocky. Don't be just just do your job. Um, it's funny enough what you're saying because this this coach, so he ended up coaching uh, big teams. I think he was at Reading. He was at big clubs. And um, at the end of my career. Well, I was playing part time already. I was 37. I was the captain of this club, uh, Conference South. So is so you know in England you go Premier League, Championship League One, League Two are the four professional. The Conference, which is the fifth division, which now every team is professional. Um, and then the sixth division is the Conference South. I end up my last the last few years I played football. I played for them as a part time, and I was the captain. And the, the manager left. And we have four months left to the season. And who came to manage the last four months <laughs> of the season? Fifteen years later. That that's great, actually. Yeah, Mister yeah. Marmagui. Oh. Mister Marmagui. <laughs> what did he did he know he was going to be coaching you? I I heard the rumor, and then I knew he lived in Brighton. He's from Brighton, and then I was so I end up. This is crazy how it, it goes up. After ten years, I moved, after eight years or something, I moved back to Brighton. So Brighton was my first trial, and I moved and I lived. I my my girls were born. I got two daughters. They were born uh, in Brighton and lived in, in Brighton um, for um, well, they weren't born in Germany actually, but they lived in Brighton all their life. And I ended up living twelve years in Brighton. So this club was close from Brighton, and uh, and then yeah, Marmagi. And then I remember talking to him the first session. Yeah. And then I said because I was the captain of this club, and then. Um, and then he said, I don't know if you remember, Marwa, you, you rejected me, like, in 2003, I think it was. 2003, you were the Brighton, the manager. They were top of the league, of the, of the third division. Yeah. They ended up getting promoted to a championship that year. And then, uh, and then he said to me that he remembered. He said, I do remember you. Um, and he was, we were joking, laughing and joking. Uh, but he said he, he, that he did remember. I said, I'm not sure. For two weeks, you know, two I, weeks, 15 years I, ago. I, I, I have to say it's um that your your <laughs> some things just seem it seems like fate you know like you started your your journey in England with uh with that manager and then you ended it with him as well that is uh that's Crazy. like you can't you can't write uh no. write that I, story. Honestly, I was laughing <laughs> I was laughing I couldn't believe it after so many years and and we were talking about about that, and and then he's a really nice man, really really nice man. And the team was struggling when he came. And to be fair, we ended up uh, not going down that year, which was a massive thing for the club, not getting relegated. And and Mark helped us. That was only four months that we were together. It was it was funny. <laughs> that's that's amazing. Um, so I think like you know we've we've barely scratched the surface. So we're gonna have to like do like a. a a part two uh and maybe part three and four for um for this for sure but um uh i do want to like i don't want to leave it just at like you know the e the end of brighton what uh what was kind of what were your thoughts from there did you think about going back to argentina did you were you determined to stay in england what was kind of like the next step after facing that rejection you know, that was that was another thing i had my ticket because it was a big thing my mom so my family, I'm really close to my family in Argentina. My dad followed me from football since I was little. My, all my family, my sister and my mom as well. But my dad was like kind of, you know, pushing me. Not pushing yeah. me, but he was proper always there. And and, yeah. then, and then he said, son, it doesn't matter what you do because I'm thinking I don't want to go back. That's why I said after this, I said, I'm staying. I'm not going back home because to one of my friends who went to Italy and he come back, he didn't get the trial few months before I, I came, they started shouting from the stand, like, oh, he's, um, well, the, the word in English, like, basically, um, basically that you, you, did, you didn't do yeah. well. But you didn't do well, and then you just went back. Um, uh, and I was like, I said to my dad, I said to my dad, no one's going to shout that to me. If I'm going to Europe, I said this was in Argentina before going. If I'm going, like, they're not going to shout that to me. And then, and then my dad said, at the time, this was before, he said, don't be silly. He said, let them shout wherever they, they want. He said, at least you try them. 
or Nico was my, my mate who didn't work out in Italy. He said, at least he tried it. At least he tried it and he come back. Like he can say that. These, these people never tried nothing in their life probably. And then they just criticize him because of these people who... So, but in my head, I was like, I'm not going back. A rejection. I'm not going back, rejected. So that's, uh, I don't know, that's uh, mentally, um, you have to be strong, I guess. So I said to my dad, I had the ticket. My mom was really upset because I was living to England and the, the, the boy, like she didn't know where I was staying. So I said, I got the ticket to come back in six weeks, mom. I said, whatever happens, I'm, the trial going well or no, I'm coming back. I got the ticket. So anyway, after this, when the two weeks, I said to my dad, I'm going to change the ticket. I'm not going back. So I uh, I changed the ticket for an extra three months, and then I'm in that staying. I went to another club in the in the this was in the fifth division, walking, trained for a week, and I end up. It's a long story. I end up fight, uh, having a, a, an argument with with this agent, a Cameroonian agent, and I end up leaving that trial. He he never took me again to this trial, and then leaving his house, mm-hmm. and then uh, well, I think you read it in the book, but I end up meeting like. How coincident! My mom met with the uh, with the mom from one of the guys who used to play with me in Argentina, and he was also on trial in in England at the time. Which I didn't speak to him in about two years because he went to Spain, and, and I never spoke from him again. So I contacted him after having this argument with with the Cameroonian, and I said, uh, basically, they kicked me out from the house. Yeah. So I said, right, Christian, like, can you? He said, yeah, come. I spoke to his agent, another Argentinian guy who really helped me, Jorge, an amazing guy. And he said, come to live with us. And that, that, that's what I started enjoying it because I had another guy and someone else with me. I wasn't on my own. So we were both going on trial together. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that, that's, that's amazing. Um, and it's, yeah. it's like, like I told you, Chris, it's, it's, it's a long story. That's why we wrote the book. But yeah, I never knew the book was going to be this guy who wrote the book. is an amazing, amazing guy, one of my friends. And he said, my dream is to write a book. And I was like, I said, I said, I said, Juan, like, who's going to read it? Apart from my family and my friends. I said, I, I, you know, I, I never played in the Premier League. I, I'm not a big player. And at the time, I, I didn't play in the FA Cup this Big yeah. game against Man United or against Chelsea for uh, in the in the um, oh, Carling Cup. So at the time I was like just playing playing low divisions, and I said to him, "Like who's?" And then he said, "Look, my dream is to read is to write a book. I think your story is amazing." He said, "I love I love your determination. I love your attitude, and I think you can help so many kids." And I was like, "I was like, okay, let's do it." <laughs> So we put we put uh, we put time ourselves. Say, look, I got my first two months. I was writing every day a diary. Yeah. So I when, kept that. Yeah. When did um, at, this was while you were still playing? Where where were you playing? What team were you playing for? When I was uh, when I started writing a book. Yeah. I think I was at Crawley. I think I was. Okay. All right. Yeah, so it was. one of the, my last professional clubs. I did play against Chelsea, sorry. I didn't play at the time. I wasn't playing against Man United. But we said, we're going to write We're gonna write the book when we want. Like, yeah. you know, if I feel like today, so we both used to connect like that, like on Zoom. Well, no, it wasn't Zoom, but it was loads of emails, loads of yeah. emails. And then, um, and then it took us two years. And in these two years, my second year was when we played against Man United at Old Trafford. So, yeah, so, so that's, that came right at the end of the book, which is amazing because it took us two years to write the book. We said, we're not going to do it from one day to another. We need to do it properly. And uh, so he got his dream of writing a book. And he, now he's got about four or five books he wrote. Amazing, amazing, amazing guy, amazing writer. For you, we had to translate it from Spanish to English. Yeah. Because Spanish. So some of the stuff in English, I read it and, and I was like, well, I'm not sure if it, if, if it comes across exactly how I want it to come across. Uh-huh. Uh, but it was that's why the story is so long, and that's why I knew it in one in one in one hour. We wouldn't get the whole. <laughs> yeah, no, no, we'll 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 do another one uh, for sure. Um, from this, from I guess this first part of the um, of the story, um, I want to I want to do um, 
something I like to do at the, at the end of the podcast is like three key takeaways. Um, so, um, just like, you know, like a, um, little point that someone can, uh, can, uh, can take away from the, from the podcast. Do you have, uh, do you have any, like, you know, just one piece of like kind of advice or something um, like that? Uh, I don't know if it's an advice, but I can say why it worked for me. And I think it, it, it worked for many people and well, just never give up, uh, have that, that mentality that things are going to go wrong. Things can happen, uh, but it's just just keep going. Like believe in yourself, and and then just just um, just just be a nice person. Be yeah. a nice person because, like I said, like you never know. Football is a small world. Well, football or any anything in life, uh, you know, people talk about. And and then I think that that education I got it from from my parents. And I said. Um, Two things might I say. Never be late for work and be a nice person and be kind. So um I took I took I took that on board and then just to start I would say hopefully I haven't got many people who dislike me in the game in, in uh, <laughs> you know in in the time I've been in England. But yeah just just this these things that like believe in yourself, uh don't give up because people are gonna try to put you down, especially if they see you weak. Like I was weak, like uh, with my English, I didn't speak. Like it happens to you that you couldn't speak in, in when you went to Greece. Yeah, uh, and people are laughing. People might laugh about you, but just um, I read something that um, Lisandro Martinez, you know, played for Man United. He said the other day he got criticized a lot for his stature. Oh, his height, yeah, his height. And then he's like, uh, I read something he said the other day in the interview. Uh, he said. Um, constructive criticism, yes, I, I do listen. But he said people who are coming from mala leche, like with with no intention, he yeah. said, he said that's they hurt themselves. He said I'm not I'm not interested in that. And that, I think that's so strong as well, so powerful that yeah, you do you do listen to constructive criticism because because you're not perfect. I know you believe in yourself and you think you could play and you, but you know you you got weaknesses like everyone. Uh, probably Messi is the only one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. I think. I think like another like really really important thing is like, um, to like something I always say to players is you have to you have to give yourself like a chance to to actually succeed. Um, and that's like you know with your story, a big part of that is getting yourself to England. Um, and and trying. And I think like you know a lot of players, if if you're always thinking like about, you know, you said like things do go wrong, but if you're always thinking about everything that could go wrong, you don't leave time to think about what could go right. And like, even if you had gone to England and in the end, if things hadn't worked out as, as incredibly as they did, um, I think like, at least, you know, you did everything you could. I think that's, I think that's the important thing um, is, you know, doing, doing what you can because it's always going to get tough um but i mean no one no one got to the professional level um and it was all you know easy and you know you know no sleepless nights or you know endless hours of uh of training and i think you have to you have to give yourself a chance and then like you know i i talk about this a lot about like you know being on the field and stuff and um you know i see uh, i talk a lot about players like playing scared and stuff um and you can't like you can't, you can't live scared and you can't, and you can't play scared because, you know, if, uh, if you do think, you know, things aren't going um, to work out. It's crazy how much, how much is, uh, mentally, yeah. how, how much in the game. Yeah. You could be technically good in that, but you have to be, uh, mentally strong, which we're going to talk probably in the next one that I yeah. went from a different, pre- a difficult period at one point that my head was telling me completely against me. And it never happened before in my in my life. And I was like, that was the closest I went. I'm thinking I'm going back home because I don't like this. I'm not enjoying going to training, which it never happens. But we're gonna get to that after. Yeah. But that's what when I learned to basically train your mind and then with the help of a psychologist, I had to go and see someone, which um and the help of the family and friends that 
um, when I see these these big stars playing on TV, uh, you know, you think, you know, they got a the nice life. It's such a such a tough course. They like footballers and they do dream from every single kid probably in the world, but they probably went through a lot to get to where they are, and they it's not easy. It's not easy what they live in day to day, and then all the people who are trying to shoot you down because when you're at that top level, they trying to shoot me down when I was playing in fourth fifth division. Yeah. Um, and you just you just exactly what you said. Just give yourself a chance, and of course, listen to listen to constructive criticism. Trying to work on your you think your weaknesses. For example, me was my left foot, my my physicality and my left foot. I wish I trained that before. If I'm coaching kids now every day, and I said, please use your weak foot. Like learn to use your weak foot is such an advantage when you can use both feet when you grow yeah. up. It's, it's one of the key things for me with little kids that I'm coaching. I wish someone told me that when I was little. And yeah. so I knew I had to improve on all that. So they negative because they were negative. They didn't give me the try, they didn't give me the, the deal I wanted. But I focus on them points. And then um and then of course believe that you are there for for a reason. Yeah. And then, then you you're good, but you can work you still got work to do. So don't think, yeah, you are great and then that's it, because it's not gonna work. Yeah, I, lo- I love that you talk about like, you know, seeing those stars on, on TV and thinking like, like everyone thinks like, oh, they have it easy, like everything's fine. But like, I think like, um, there are so I-, I get a lot of athletes come to me and they say like that they have like, they get really nervous before games. And whenever someone asks me that question, I always say, if you could get rid of those nerves, but it made you play worse. Would you get rid of those nerves and play worse? Or would you rather have those nerves and play better? Because I think a lot of people think that like Messi or Ronaldo or, you know, all these other players, they walk into a game and they're like, so calm and confident and everything's going to go well. I've heard Messi uh, stories about Messi used to throw up before games um, because he was like so nervous. Um, And then he'd go out and he was still, though those were like like 10 years ago or whatever, when he was playing, uh, still playing incredibly, but it doesn't mean you're not going to be nervous before. So I think those, you know, those three, three key takeaways, maybe, you know, is believe in yourself, give yourself a chance, you know, work hard and be, you know, open to, um, constructive criticism. And if it's not constructive, don't listen to it. Mm -hmm. And then number three, don't think that, you know, even when you succeed, I think like something I would say is like, as you succeed, things, things get harder. It's not, you know, <laughs> you don't, you don't become a professional and then you're like, oh, I made it. It's all good now. It's like, that's when the real work starts. No, that, exactly. Exactly. And, and, and it's funny when you say that, but in the book, we mentioned about the wheel. Like sometimes you write, like basically your, your, your life goes around a wheel. Uh, uh, and then sometimes you're at the top and sometimes you write at the bottom. Yeah. Then and then and then you it keeps going, it keeps going. But it's just that's when you need to learn about life, and not just sports. Uh, it's just life. That's why when we wrote a book, it wasn't just uh, yeah. My dream was to be a footballer, but we trying to focus on on other players' dream. Like it might be to be I don't know to be a, an electrician, or but so you have to study, you have to do this, you have to do that to to, to get to the top. It's not gonna be like that. You have bumps on the I way. That, yeah, it's really, really important to 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 learn that and to take that uh, on board. All right. Well, we'll we'll pick back up uh, with a uh, with a uh, Sergio's story um, next time. Um, we'll hop on another call um, and and chat about it. Um, if uh, I'll put a I'll put a link to the book um, in the in the description so people can check that out. Um, and I'll put some links to uh, Sergio's probably his Instagram, um, so you can check that out as well. Um, but yeah, thanks for watching uh, or, or listening. Um, and yeah, we'll uh, we'll see you next time with uh, with part two of this uh, you know incredible story. Thank you, Chris. All right, awesome.